everyone, my name is Astrid and I'm a corporate relation for our Indonesian program. For this batch, we have selected startups that focus mainly on fintech, health tech, food and agri-tech, logistic, lifestyle, and enterprise 4.0. Before we start the startup pitch, I would like to have GK Plug and Play Indonesian Director Aaron Neal to share a little bit about Indonesian program. Please welcome Aaron Neal. Thank you, Astrid, for the very warm introduction. Uh, hi, very happy to welcome all of you here today for APEC Summit GK Plug and Play program. Today, we'll be showcasing eight of GK Plug and Play startups. GK Plug and Play is a joint venture between PNP and Gan Consuendo a local Indonesian strategic investment alliance. Because of the joint venture, we've been able to make significant headway into the Indonesian market. Since coming into Indonesia in 2016, we've accelerated over 85 startups, made over 25 investments, and currently we have six corporate partners. Here, you'll see a snapshot of the over 85 startups we've accelerated over the past seven batches. These startups fall into three big buckets. One, financial services, two, food and ag tech, and three, industry 4.0. Before we do get into the eight exciting pitches today, I do want to take some time to talk about the Indonesian market overview. As you know, COVID has had a great impact on Indonesians, and today I want to focus specifically on Indonesian SMEs. As you know, Indonesian SMEs are the backbone of the economy, contributing to over 60% of the national GDP. According to a survey by UNDP uh, with Indonesian young entrepreneurs as the correspondents, almost 80% of the an entrepreneur said that COVID-19 has negatively affected their business, with 58% saying that they've experienced financial downturn of up to 81%. So what does this mean for consumers and their behavior? We have to come to grips with the fact that there is a new norm. This new norm affects all aspects of life, from the way we shop, to the way we work, to the way we seek entertainment. This new consumer behavior has really accelerated and boosted digital transformation adoption. Companies across all sizes are looking for new ways to acquire and engage with customers and their new behavior. With that in mind, this provides us a very natural segue into the eight, pitch, eight startups and their pitches today. As you'll hear in a bit, these eight companies are providing solutions that are very much geared towards the new consumer behavior, and you'll see that the solutions they're providing will be relevant now more than ever. Last thing before we do get started, I'd like to extend our warmest gratitude to our seven corporate partners without whose support we would never be able to achieve what we've achieved over the past years. I'd like to extend a warmest welcome to Nestle, our newest corporate partner. We look forward to working with you guys to achieve your innovation initiatives for the coming years. With that in mind, I'd like to pass it back to our wonderful MC for this session, Astrid. Next, we have our keynote segment. Let's welcome our next speakers. Okay, I'd like to share with you the, some digital native companies who have market cap with over a trillion dollars, right? Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. Although they're in different business from search, e-commerce, device, and software, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. They have two things in common. One, all of their employees are digital native what we call it modern digital cyborg workers. The second thing is they all leverage internet, mobile, cloud, and AI. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is On Lee. I'm the CTO of GDP Venture, as well as the CEO and CTO of GDP Labs. Today, I'd like to share with you about the technology-led growth, enterprise, and startups. So the agenda is, uh, I like to set the context of this conversation in background. Most of you know about this already, and then I'm going to say, to share also some of the problems both in enterprise as well as in enterprises. And, and then we're going to see how the enterprise and startup can overcome all those challenges and actually turn this problem into opportunities. And then I'm going to share also some specific action item what we need to do going forward. So on the background, actually about a century ago, for the past century, in the 20th century specifically, there has been a technology-led economic growth like we are seeing today, except there were different technology like electricity, telephone, automobiles, radio, and TV. A lot of this as, as a result 
everybody's income increase, GDP increase, economy growth. Everybody was super excited and productivity in, in, increase. Now, the story repeat itself now as we are experiencing today. Now, specifically, uh, if I want to zoom in in the technology sector in the computer industry, if you look for the past 60 years, right, the first commercial of mainframe in the 1960s, followed by mini computer, workstation, PC, internet, cloud, mobile, and now today we are in the AI era, another emerging technology. And then while we are working on it, there's a new one also coming called quantum computing. So if you look back for the past 60 years, the innovation they built on based on the previous innovation, saw our product, productivity increase as well as the innovation also accelerated, especially during this pandemic. Now, at the same time, if you look for the past, since World War II, right, for the past 70 years now, we have five generations from generation XYZ, generation alpha, as well as baby boomers, right? Now, if you look, all the generation alpha, generation X, Y, and Z, we call them as digital native because some of them were actually born in digital world. Some of them were raised in digital world, right? Some of them raised in the social networking, mobile computing, and iPad. But if you look, the other side of it, the elder generation X, especially the baby boomers, what we call digital immigrants, because what happened is they were not born and raised with this, uh, this technology. So as a result, they have to adapt, right? Especially for baby boomers. Right now, a lot of them have to adapt with this new world, the new normal, especially during pandemic because their colleagues, their friends, family, children, grandchildren are using digital to communicate. So they have no choice. So as a result now, we have this five generation of user, all are using digital. So as a result, we can see almost 60% of the world population now actually digital users. Now, as a result of these new things that coming uh, in fast pace like this, that also represent both challenges and opportunity. So I want to talk about the problem first. For example, for the past 20 years since the internet become popular, actually because of this technology, a lot of enterprise who did not attack, who did not adapt into this new environment, the technology environment, Many of them actually went bankrupt, right? In fact, it's been studied that this, the, the largest 500 companies, their lifespan actually has been reduced. It used to be 60 years old now, it's only 20 years. And in fact, the lifespan of startup even much shorter than that. Some of them will die within a couple of years and more will be dying uh, in the next five years, right? So this is also confirmed by the recent report from BCG, the digital transformation, only you know, 30% meet or exceeded target. But the rest is kind of questionable. A lot of this time, effort, and resources, and money spent on it still didn't meet the expectation of the, or only a few that succeeded. And many of them actually failed, right? And then here's another one for the past, few years, AI has been a hype, right? So actually, many of them actually failed to deliver. And yet, a few of them, as we saw earlier, are su very successful, right? So let's take a look how enterprise who have been very successful for decades, even centuries, how to adapt into this environment. Now, if you look back, based on various case studies on, on this side, what we call the losers. Some of them either actually went bankrupt already, disappear, or get merged or acquired. Some of those five names are actually a global brand name already. On the other hand, there are some winners, right? Some of them as old as over a century old, they were still thriving, not only surviving, they're actually more and more successful, right? And actually on here, I put global name, but as well as uh, a local company, uh, BCA, they, they are over 60 years old. They are thriving now. They are making profit in billions annually. 
So the way they did it was because they adapt to a new environment. When there's something new, they readapt. So they are willing to do some kind of quote unquote surgery, not only just bend it, doing this afterthought. They are where they were willing to take a chance to do a major surgery in the organization, how to improve their business. That's how they become the winners. Now, if you look from the customer point of view, right, they just want to solve the customer pain point. Hey, solve my problems, right? Now, back then, a lot of companies said, well, the way we solve it, whether we should build, buy, or partner. But now, you have to do all of them. Why is that? Because you need to focus on your core businesses, right? Don't try to do everything yourself because things are, are more complicated now, more complex, and you, people don't wait for you. So you have to move fast on this one, right? Try do not reinvent the wheel, right? If there are things open source, cloud services out there, just use it. It's a company offer this. If this is not your core competency, go for it because speed matters, right? Now, so we want to build a painkiller, not something like, not a vitamin, nice to have. So with this, most of the, especially for enterprise customer, this is more logical for them. Hey, if this is save me money, save my time and increase my revenue, I'll pay for it. So that's the way we should do it. Build, buy and partner all of them, not one of them. The other one is this. If you look for the past 30 years, technology, a kind of quote unquote second class citizen becomes support, cost center, indirect impact, right? But today it's totally different. It becomes strategic and become a new growth engine, right? It has direct impact to your business, whether this is reducing costs or increasing your revenue, increasing profit, increasing productivity. So it has different role. You have to change the mindset, how the technology play on this. So I want to share with you a framework, right? Like I said earlier, this trillion dollars company, they have this one thing in common. They leverage this platform, PC, internet, cloud, and mobile computing. Not, technology alone is not enough. You have to have to use the data. Data is the new oil. Most people say that I would like to call it digital oil, but the raw data is useless. You need to turn this data into knowledge by using AI algorithm. On top of it, you also have to apply new business model, right? It's, it was unthinkable 20 years ago to give something for free. But right now, there are many companies giving you for free because they make money from other ways, not charging directly to, to the customer from the other side of the market that they're charging and make money. So this is one of those uh, most challenging thing is not only looking at technology, but you also to revisit your business model. And the other thing is process because everything is move fast. Remember, it used to be just regular mail right? and then we have email, which is much faster. And now we have messaging app like WhatsApp. All those things used to be weeks turn to days, days to minutes, and to seconds. So we have to change the way we do business in terms of with new process. And on top of that, this is also last, but it's very important to build ecosystem. You need to partner. Like I said earlier, you cannot do everything yourself. Whatever you do, you need to partner. In fact, there's another one thing in common of all those trillion dollars company. They have ecosystem. They have partners worldwide. Okay, and most of all, it's a company commitment. It's not like from the top or bottom, it has top down and bottom up. Everybody has to have this mindset in this new world. So I want to share with you this case study BCA group, right? They are uh, founded in 57, so about 63 years old man, by now. They are, they are full-time employee over 25,000, including their temporary consultant, maybe over 50,000. And their market cap is 46 billion US dollars. This is the largest private bank in Indonesia. It's a public company. They actually today, they have all the system from mainframe, mini computer, workstation, 
PC, Internet, Mobile, Cloud, AI, they are doing all of this because they kept reinventing themselves depending where they are, what the customer wants. So all of this, this is just a great example where um, successful company that has been around for decades, not only they survive this through this during hard time, they actually thrive, right? Because they adopt that framework. So let's switch into startup now, right? And many people talk about startup because some of them become big companies now and part of our daily lives. So the media like to share all the success story. So let's see what they, if you look for the past 10 years, what, are, what were their secret weapons? One is cloud computing. Cloud computing, the first commercial one successful was by AWS 14 years ago. A lot of people don't want to use it because, hey, I don't want to put data in public cloud computing, right? But startup have no choice. They are more open-minded. They use it. As a result, they move faster, cheaper, and more agile because of this thing, right? It helps them tremendously. And along the way, cloud mobile computing also come along like iOS and Android, right? They are willing to tap this. Not only um, they tap this, actually they create a new industry, a new business opportunity because of the combination of mobile and cloud computing. But I think the one that most overlooked why startup is very successful for the past 10 years is because the enterprises did nothing. They keep doing the old things, right? Because they were successful back then during that time without this technology. But with this technology, suddenly a lot of these startups could provide similar service, even better services for a much cheaper cost and much faster. So that's why some of these startups are very successful because the enterprises did nothing. So it was their opportunity. But now it's no longer enough. Why? Because for the past five years, a lot of enterprises adopt cloud computing, mobile computing. So they have the same, they, even because they have a lot of money, they have customers already, they are, they are decades ahead, they have big data already. So now, a lot harder for startup to be successful like 10 years ago. So what should they do about this, right? Because of, again, this is a new environment, right? So if you look at this, this is uh, the most well-known diagram for the past 20 years. A lot of startup kind of has to read this book. So it has to focus on the early market innovators and early adopters. Focus on that one because these are the people that are willing to take a chance, take a risk to work with a startup to do a proof of concept, whatever they're offering. And then you can later go after the um, majority after that. So I summarize this into ASAP to differentiate your startup. One is availability, right? For example, electricity. If you want to use it, it's available all the time, right? When I was in the US, if I want to buy a car, they give me a test drive. If I like it, I buy it. It's immediately available, risk-free. I don't have to wait for months or years to get it. The other thing is simplicity. Again, I use this electricity. Electricity is very simple, right? You just flip a switch on and off, you get it or you don't. It's, we want to make things as simple as that, right? Uh, young children, elderly people can use it. Same with radio and TV. And the other one is affordability. You have to make it affordable so it can be adopted by mass market. Again, I use this electricity. When we use electricity, when we think, oh, should I use it? How much it costs? We never think about it because this thing is so affordable, right? Some of them cannot be free, but it's low cost enough. People ignore it, right? And then the other thing is, if you look, why mainframe kind of stall now? Even the mini computer industry and workstation industry kind of die because of PC, because it's affordable. So free and low cost actually a killer and disruptive feature. 
And the other one is a platform. Why is it important to build a platform? For example, PC, internet, cloud computing, mobile computing, AI, those are platforms because enable you to extend what you have based on the building block. So in summary, startups should have this ASAP, availability, simplicity, affordability of their platform. So let's take a look at some case study. Today, we are in the era of narrow AI. So what that means is there is no such thing as general purpose AI. AI is good to do one thing and one thing only, highly specialized. So let's take a look on this example. Let's say if you have a lot of documents, right, whether that's government, industry standard, or even internal company document. And then let's say some of them you need to digitize it. So you need to put OCR to convert into digital, and then make correction is needed by labeling it, right? And then you process NLP, natural language processing, to give various solution depending what you need, right? So these are example that three companies, three AI company, provide end-to-end -end solution based on their specialty, right? And then here is another example. You know, this is HR is like over a centuries old system, but now we reinvent this because of AI. Because of NLP, you can ask for your vacation, you know, your leave of absence, and get your status, everything through chatbot. This is powered by AI. And also, you can also get government regulation. You can ask this immediately, and you can get from the trusted sources from the government itself. So this way, it, and they are available all the time. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And this kind of reinvent HR because of this AI power chatbot. So with this, uh, I want to summarize this. What should we do going forward? One, we have to recognize digital AI transformation is never ending journey. Right? So as a result, Expect something new in the next five years. And of course, all this technology are driven by people. Make sure we have the right people. Keep training our people. If needed, we have to hire new employees with new skills. The second thing is adapt. There will be something new. In the 20th century, we have this thing called new era. And then we have new economy during internet boom, right? Eh, and now, during this pandemic, we call it new normal. I don't know what else next for the next 10 years, 20 years. There will be something new. So we need to be able to adapt, learning, unlearning, and relearning. Last but not least, if you want to do, you have to do something different. If you want to become different with different output, right? So this way, you will gain speed while your competitors are falling behind. So thank you. Startup focusing on fintech include Brancas that provide a large scaling payment, transaction, and cash management system. When it comes to agritech, we have Sayurbox, which is a platform that over a variety of products for a healthy lifestyle. We also have other startups in different focus areas, such as health, logistics, and enterprise 4.0. Bringing up our very first startup, this startup is a web-based platform that offers vegetables and fruit for a healthy lifestyle. Please welcome Sayurbox. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here, especially thanks to GK Plug and Play, um, having been our first investors and supporting us for, uh, right from the beginning. Um, I'm Amanda, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company uh, called Sayurbox. We started in 2017 and we source and distribute fresh produce directly from farms to end consumers. So we do the end to end supply chain of fresh produce. The problem that we're trying to solve is actually the inefficiency of the supply chain for fresh produce in Indonesia. If we see in Indonesia, uh, farmers are completely fragmented. They have no access to demand uh, information. So there ends up being high 
oversupply or under, even undersupply. So prices fluctuate a lot and uh, they don't have access to logistics and distributions to go directly from farm to end consumers. So what ends up happening is farmers get very, very low prices and consumers get extremely high prices. So this is just to illustrate. On average, there is about five uh, to seven middlemen in between. And the wastage ends up being about 30 to 40 percent throughout the supply chain. And another 30 percent are produce that farmers cannot harvest. So what we do is we buy directly from farmers. We have the end to end uh, supply chain and logistics uh, for fresh produce. And we deliver these products directly to end consumers. So it is a lot more efficient. Our wastage uh, is kept as well very low at 4 percent. So this is just an overview of what the supply chain looks like. So it goes from our collection centers, which is located near the farms. And from there, it goes to our main warehouse, the produce, uh, where there's aggregation, picking and packing happens to be delivered uh, to our distribution hubs, uh, which here what happens is it's cross stock from truck to motorcycles and then it's delivered to our end consumers, whether it's uh, B2C or B2B. This includes all the grading, the wastage, and then from the consumer side, we have our own app, but we also connect to partners such as Grab, Gojek, uh, and B2B partners. So we've been growing pretty steadily month on month, um, around 20 to 30 percent, and we've achieved about seven times growth since last year with Im improved metrics throughout our financials. And our customers consist predominantly B2C, but we do also sell to supermarkets, including Food Hall, um, Alpha Midi, and we also work closely with Tokopedia and Grab to be the uh, logistics fulfillment for their fresh needs. And we're, we've been grow we're aiming to be pretty aggressive. So we are uh, focused on building more uh, demand channels, improving our B2C, also working closely with re uh, resellers and um, our partners. So we're aiming for about $110 million by uh, 2022. And I do believe we have the right team to do it. So my background has been in agriculture and distribution. Um, we have Meta, uh, more on the supply chain, Rama, who uh, was ex-CPO of Gojek. So he's more involved in the product and tech side. Nachita uh, on the growth uh, side. Her background is in McKinsey, as well as Arif and Gogo. So that's a little bit about Sirebox. We would love um, to see if there's any form of partnership that we could um, work together with and happy to chat. Thank you so much. Next, we have startup in meta company that focus on personalization of dosing and prescription. Their mission is to provide actionable and cost-effective genetic testing for precision. Let's welcome Nala Genetics. Hi, my name is Levy and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nala Genetics and we are here to help providers unlock the power of personalized care. Trial and error prescription costs $80 billion of healthcare waste and $1.5 billion in Southeast Asia every year. They are responsible for fatal and harmful adverse drug reactions, and studies have shown that 70% of them have high genetic associations. So genetic testing for drug response have the potential to reduce these effects, but not so much in developing markets. We think that this is because of the lack of support to physicians who are not trained in phys practicing personalized care with genetic testing, and also the lack of evidence in the local population, as most of these genetic studies are done in developed markets, with Caucasian populations. So imagine a solution where doctors have access to affordable and impactful genetic testing, but also contribute to validating the biomarkers in their local population by gathering real world evidence via our clinical decision support system. What does that solution look like? 
Well, Ina can tell you all about it. Ina just finished her chemotherapy and is about to be prescribed tamoxifen for the next five years to reduce her chances of breast cancer occurrence. Her doctor, being registered with Knowledge Genetics, checks for drug gene interactions and sees that she qualifies for cyp 2 d 6 testing. He orders a kit to be sent to Ina's home and our team guides the buccal set swab sample collection process. In three to five days, her reports re- inform her doctor that she is a cyp 2 d 6 poor metabolizer. Her doctor prescribes aromatase inhibitor instead. Because her therapy is slightly different than her peers, her doctors monitor her care through our mobile app. This data, captured in this process, helps her doctor treat others like her. This approach is developed by a team of experts in genetic discovery and translation. And our team is able to efficiently install capabilities of healthcare provider partners in our panel by teaching them how to run our in-house developed, and therefore more affordable, qPCR tests and cloud software. Moreover, it is free for doctors with continuous training and research. All this value is delivered to patients who will be paying out of pocket, but with more data, more payers will reimburse the test. Being able to launch with local partners quickly is an advantage in developing markets, which are often fragmented, compared to competitors who focus on running centralized lab operations. Other players in the field skip working with the hospitals completely and market their tests directly to patients. But we think working with hospital partners is key to developing impactful genetic tests. So we have worked with leading institutions in Singapore to prove preemptive use of genetic testing and reactive use in Indonesia in breast cancer, psychiatry, leprosy, and COVID-19. And at the end of the day, we believe that our platform can help providers and payers make better decisions by combining genetic data, clinical outcomes, and patient behavior, which drives sustainable adoption of preventive care for everybody. Thank you. Coming up next, we have Norm. Norm is here to help men live healthily and have f- excellent performance in effective, easy, and affordable. Please welcome Norm. Hi everyone, my name is Walton and I'm the co-founder of Celestial. We are based in Jakarta and our vision is to empower people so they can perform their best every single day. And the way we're doing this is by creating a portfolio of consumer health brands for the modern consumer. And we're starting this journey with our first brand, Norm which is a digital platform for men's health and grooming. We found that as much as one in two men will experience at least one lifestyle health condition, such as hair loss, acne, ED, and PE, yet many of these men have not really seek treatment. And the reason behind this is that a lot of men just aren't aware that effective treatments exist, and a lot of them are still embarrassed to seek outside help. So we've developed a platform where we connect doctors, pharmacies, with the patients, where they can come into our platform answer a few simple questions that takes about 10 minutes to complete, upon which a doctor will review their responses and provide them a treatment recommendation. After receiving the recommendation, they can uh, order directly from our platform and receive support from our team of care specialists throughout their journey of care. Currently, we offer a mix of OTC and prescription products for hair loss, ED, PE, and acne. And we're also working to develop OTC products for men's skin care, hair care, and health supplements. The market size for men's health and grooming is large in Indonesia. It's estimated to be $1 billion in 2020, and is still growing double-digit growth rates every single year. We're also looking to expand into other consumer health verticals, with affiliate brands for women and for nutrition as well. With regards to our business model, we offer our doctor consultations and recommendations completely for free, and we monetize off of our products sold. Currently, our AOVs are just over 300,000 rupiah on contribution margins of 45%. We continue to look to expand our product categories with a focus on consumables with high repeat intent. Currently, our sales are predominantly from our own website, but we continue to expand our sales channels across marketplaces, reseller networks, 
and select offline outlets. You know, since we do offer prescription treatments, our orders are currently processed in our affiliate licensed pharmacy, and we do nationwide shipping um, supported by a third-party logistic provider. The team is currently uh, run by my, my, my other co-founder, Waldo, and myself, and we operate the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And supporting us is a team of medical advisors who are specialists in their respective fields. To date, we process over 10,000 consultations on our platform across our different health categories. And since our beta launch last November, we've grown our daily consultations by seven times, and we've also grown our order, vo order volume by 45 times, all the while we've reduced our customer acquisition cost by half. We're very open to connect with you, whether you are a corporate, a startup, an investor, or a brand. Please feel free to reach out. We'll be super happy to uh, ex discuss and explore uh, areas where we can collaborate. Thank you so much. Next, uh, we have Fashion Style Platform. Their mission is to help women fine-tune their fashion flares. They help women look good, feel good, and feel confident. Please welcome Yuna Enko, your fashion matchmaker. Meet Cindy. Cindy has recently started working in a publishing company. She is confident and stylish in her workplace. Then COVID-19 happened, and she suddenly had to stay home majority of her time. She spent time browsing and consuming content. She likes what Sierra G wears in a K-drama that she watched, so she tried browsing for similar items. The process took her forever and stressful for her, and when she finally found a product, it doesn't fit her figure. And what's worse, the products look completely different from the photos. When she tries contacting her seller, the seller responded very poorly. The whole process is upsetting and wasteful. And that's why we exist. We are Yuna & Co. Our personal stylist, enabled by machine learning, finds the right fit, fashion and style for customers of different needs. We help people like Cindy find the styles that she likes so she can feel happy and confident even during the pandemic. Let me show you how we do it. Cindy can easily find us on our website or through our mobile app. First, Cindy needs to register and fill out her style profile so we can pair her with the right stylist for Cindy. Anytime Cindy wants to get a new set of styles, she just needs to send a request and wait for her styles to be picked personalized for her. The stylist will curate the items as per Cindy's request using our machine learning driven dashboard. Our stylist will also write a personal note for Cindy to advise her on how to mix and match the style. Cindy can check out the items she likes, pay for them, and it will then get delivered. Once received, Cindy can experience the magic of opening her personalized box. Cindy can try on the clothes within the comfort of her own home and return the items that she might not like by sending her feedback. This way, our stylist can send better selections next time. COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of e-commerce. Clothing is one of the biggest contributors of them. With over $12 billion of expected revenue in Southeast Asia, 50% comes from Indonesia, with an expected growth of 42% until 2025. Unlike other places in the market, we are disrupting the normal retail and e-commerce e with a customer-first approach through our personal stylist. We sell in a set, so we can also give customers up to 20% lower price from retail. And because we listen to customers, we have also been able to keep a lower number for return items compared to the industry standard. We are currently collaborating with over 120 brands as suppliers, 60 of them joined during COVID-19. Our customers' acquisition comes 80% from content and word of mouth. Our customer acquisition cost is low. We have over 42,000 members that has joined and styled over 14,000 customers where 90% highly recommends our service. Last year, we were able to grow 4x in revenue. This year, despite COVID-19, we have been able to maintain equal performance month over month with 2019. And this is driven from offering new services to the market, driving 43% of our revenue. As customer retention, we are sending over 2,000 personalized messages every week, showing 5% weekly sales growth. As a part of the go-to-market strategy, we are targeting the fastest growing audience of Korean Wave enthusiasts. We are a company of experts with over 10 years in working experience ranging from advertising, fashion, media, and retail. We are now raising $500,000 where $215,000 has been committed so that we can create more focus on Korean-inspired contents, reach 150,000 registered members, and further enhance our supply. If you want to know more, reach me and we can talk further. Thank you.
This startup is a platform to discover, create, and share augmented reality experience. With Assembler, you can create immersive 3D contents and interactive design on your smartphone, or even import your own 3D model to Assembler to be placed in real world using AR. Please welcome Assembler. Hi, I'm Hasbi. I'm founder and CEO of Assembler. So Assembler is a platform to discover, create, and share augmented reality experiences. We are number one 3D and AR platform in Southeast Asia. Why AR? Because we believe the way people access information in the future will be through augmented reality. So we want to empower everyone to be able to access and create AR content easily. Our mission is to become the primary platform of user-generated AR content. Global AR market is experiencing exploding growth, and it is predicted to hit 32 billion US dollar in three years from now. And this is driven by several factors. One is technological, which is the internet is become cheaper and faster, and then the penetration of smartphone, and then the development of AR glasses by giants like Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. On the demographic side, the rise of generation Y and Z, which is the digital native generations, and the third one in the business side, which is this is the new way of the, for the businesses to visualize their product. But the problem is, making AR content is really painful. It is multidisciplinary and it's long process. So this is how typically making your content being done today. So you have to prepare the 3D model using 3D tools, and then you have to bring it to other software like Unity and Xcode to add some interactivity and AR programming there. And then you still have to deploy it on the iOS and Android to make it available for the user. And this process took months. And our solution is we simplify the process. So making your content can be as easy as drag and drop. So you can add some 3D text to the animated object, add some text, annotation, even interactivity, and all can be done within minutes using Assembly app that's running on the iOS and Android or using Assembly Studio that's running on Mac and PC. Use case and go-to-market strategy. One is from business side, so they are using Assembler for product marketing to visualize the product better and more interactive. And the second one is on the educations, which is teacher and students are using Assembler for the learning activity to be more interactive and fun. And these two sectors affecting the end users. That's why we got more than 22 million content viewed by users globally. And then we have 1.4 user-generated AR content. And we have almost 2 million app downloaded without any marketing budget. And we have more than 1,000 internal AR library, which is ready to use. In terms of monetizations, we are targeting a user, which is we are going to sell the 3D and AR sets in our marketplace. On the education side, we are target teacher, parent, and school for the subscription model. So they will, be, they will have access to the uh, topics that is aligned with curriculum. And the third one is we are targeting enterprise and SMB for the subscription model. Computer analysis, uh, there are Relative Composer, Canva, and Lens Studio. The reason I input Canva here, because the similarity of the simplifications of making design, as simple as drag and drop. Our value is on the multi-platform, because we are running on the iOS, Android, Mac, and PC, and also the simple editor, which make the process of creations very, very quick. Recognitions, we've been featured by Apple as an app of the day worldwide, and then we are joining Facebook Accelerator Singapore. We are joining Startup School YC and GK Plug and Play Indonesia. Team uh, consists of me, uh, uh, I'm a founder and CEO. I have 10 years experience in 3D and AR field. Previously, I was the co-founder and CTO of Octagon Studio. So together with Anita and Rissandar, we have 20 years plus experience in 3D and AR field. And previously, we've created AR Flashcard, which is sold to 60 countries. In terms of financial, we are looking for 550K US dollar to finalize the AR app, uh, Assembler app, Assembler EDU, Assembler Studio, and Assembler Marketplace. So Assembler, augmented reality, accessible for anyone, anywhere in one easy platform. Thank you. Hope you still enjoy this event. We still have three more startups to come. The fifth startup is from Logistics Solution Provider. 
we specialize in optimization that helps logistic and manufacturer companies to be able to plan, manage, and monitor its logistic operation. Please welcome Logic Nation. Hi, my name is Alexander Dani, CEO and co-founder of Logic Nation. Logic Nation is a software company that specializes in automating and optimizing logistics process to increase company's revenue, reducing operational costs, and improve productivity. And today, we are looking for potential corporate partner to collaborate operationally with us. Logic Nation focus is to help companies with manual processes and paper base in their logistics operations. In such operation, companies are unable to maximize their revenue because it's limitation in vehicle capacity, high operational costs and low customer service because lack of monitoring and long delivery time, and redundant business processes to prevent human error. In this current situation, where in-person interactions are avoided, there is an urgency to transform their operations from manual to automation. In Logic Nisha, we provide them one solution that enables them to increase revenue through vehicle management, reduce operational costs through root optimization, and improve logistics productivity through automation. In working with, partnering with IBM and integrating the mobile app to our operational control, we are able to manage delivery starting from driver availability, vehicle dispatching, and driver mode invoicing. To share more details on how we can contribute, previously we have a customer where they have a three warehouses and dedicated each of them with the vehicles with each fixed route. The limitation was when one of the orders were hired in certain warehouses, it required more vehicle, but the other's vehicle cannot help. We improve it by putting dynamic assignment to the vehicles and no longer we see it as a three dedicated warehouse but as a one big warehouse. It improves not only one utilization rate but also improve revenue and reducing cost by 32%. These are six main industries that we are currently targeting where we are seeing routing as a is a crucial to their operations. In today's operation, we are focusing on trucking companies and transporters in Java Indonesia. In Logic Nisha, we believe to add values by providing solution-based system and customer service as they don't know what automation is and how it benefits to them. We are also designing the price model based on subscription model so it makes sense to the operations. Our vision is to be a global logistics operating system that keep innovating and keep contributing to the stakeholders. To achieve that vision, we are starting by being their digitalization transformation partner. In the short term, we will focus on two plans. One is product development focusing on machine learning and dynamic rule engine. Second, we are also looking at product enhancement to lower the cost to customer. So if you are a corporate partner, technology partner, and our investor that would like to know more about us and collaborate with us, feel free to reach out at my email, danny.com. Thank you. Next, our startup is seeking to transform conventional workshop to become tech-enabled, capturing customer transaction through their front-end system to utilize this data as a bargaining power for manufacturers and principal to target and monetize their procurement system. Please welcome AutoClix. Hi, my name is Martin, CEO and co-founder of AutoClix. About two years ago, me and my co-founders decided to transform the automotive servicing experience in Indonesia to become easy and hassle-free. We realized that currently customers, when they service their car, they either go to authorized dealers where prices are very expensive, they need to wait a long queuing time, or they go to a mom and pop workshops where there's a lack of price transparency and the service that they actually conduct. And we realized that a lot of these mom and pop workshops is the biggest problem where currently they procure in such an expensive manner as they must go through multiple intermediaries to source their procurement parts. There's also a lack of internal controls and there's a high churn rate for their customers. 
And we realized that this is a huge issue in Indonesia as it contributes to a total of about $22 billion to the Indonesian GDP. And a lot of the other companies have begun to identify this issue, but the solution that they offer is not the optimal approach. So we, Autoclicks, decided to try create our own business model as we transform mom and pop workshops to become tech enabled by conducting leads generation to the workshop as well as streamlining the procurement supplies directly from manufacturers all the way to the workshops. And we created our own product, which is the customer mobile app as a tool for all the customers car handling needs from booking system, choosing the workshop location that they want to service in, finding the service that they want, which is standardized across all workshop, understanding the service history, receiving reminders, digital warranty again, and all the other things that they need for their automotive handling needs. And aside from that, we also built a procurement system in place while leveraging from the existing behavior to WhatsApp, where we create automation in the process by providing convenience and slowly integrating it to the workshop app going forward. And we are able to monetize from the two aspects of the business, from the procurement side, as well as the retail service in which we are able to achieve a gross profit of about 47% and 6% respectively. And we expect this number to increase as we scale, as we reduce the amount of marketing expense that we actually incur. And we have been able to recover our operation significantly over the past few months, even after the COVID situation, or even still now, as we are able to achieve a GMV run rate of about $7.9 million, a revenue run rate of about $1.4 million, serving about 8,760 car owners, as well as procuring to 94 workshops at the month of August 2020 alone. And we are a looking to expand even further in 12 months' time, scaling across Java Island, as well as looking into expanding across Indonesia in a 24-month period to be able to become the face of the automotive company here in Indonesia, where customers think about automotive needs. Autoplex comes into the picture. Thank you. Next startup is from Fintech Platform, premier financial software and solution provider in Southeast Asia, providing large scaling payment, transaction, and cash management system for e-commerce, SMEs, and companies. Please welcome Brankas. Hi, I'm Anton from Brankas. In this occasion, I would like to introduce you to Brankas, your open banking enabler partner. Our goal is to solve the last mile of open banking in Southeast Asia. As your modern API technology partner, our solution is very from transaction to a retail sales API and also the F1 platform and internet payment gateway. Transaction API help your our partner to have a modern payment and data access via an easy yet secure layers. It also could add new revenue without additional spending and bringing fintech solution for our partner. The transaction API are divided into four core products. First one is retail direct debit. The second one is corporate with disbursement, the third one is judgment with trifle, and the fourth one is QR payment. Retail Sales API helping our partner to onboard new customer, enable digital open opening, and unlock channel for loan and investment product, all through a simple and secure API layer. The Retail Sales API is built for some products such as account opening, loan origination, investment product, and warrant exchange. Open Platform and also Internet Batman Gateway are our latest product in line. The Open Platform can be used to scale up the SME business and operation by giving the SMEs to the interoperability between SMEs, providing an easy access to digital service with seamless integration and also providing the sandbox testing for easier integration process. While our LPG solution is a platform built to help our partner to provide payment services for that partner. The platform is built with various payment methods and a wide level payment page which sits within partner environment. It is also equipped with admin portal for easy access to manage technical, operational, and also analytical matter. So now you have know our solution. Let me tell a quick story about ourselves and our team. Brandas was founded in 2016. Currently our team is consists of 60 plus people across the globe. 
we are registered in several regulatory bodies such as BI in Indonesia and PC in the Philippines. We are now working closely with several banks as well as regulators which we are in process to move towards an open banking pilot project in Philippines with the Central Bank of Philippines or BSP. We are also founding member of APIX Strategy Council. Before ending this video, I would like to summarize information about Brancas in a glance. We are your veteran API technology partner with deep experience in banking, payment, and fintech. We are having first class global engineering pedigree team which help us to create best-in-class API design, protocol, and security standard. Our services are easy to integrate and implement. We have also established ecosystem partner with strong ties to banks, merchants, and regulators. Thank you for your time, and let's collaborate. And finally, we are at the end of this event. If you would like to find out more about our startup, please approach any one of us from Plug and Play. We will be more than happy to connect you.